Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all? Great. As we know that most of the part in Greater Vancouver, this is the first day of snowing for this year, and so lovely. And yeah, just keep yourself warm and safe. And also, um, I'm so excited for this day and new year next year and i believe that god is preparing something great for this church and for you all amen there's always more in god so before we go to the sermon session here uh, with joy i would like to congratulate the three uh you know our friends here our members that been baptized last week so can i invite axel to come and tony and martha to come forward please <laughs> where's martha where's axel axel is there yeah is kevin martha oh i should okay can someone okay evelyn can you please call yeah i would like to give this certificate of baptism to all of you as the pastor of this church you know with joy is what a blessing that um, we can you know we could witness your commitment dedication for the lord for your life but let's let us wait for kevin <laughs> where's kevin here okay And I'm so happy today that uh, the newcomers here and then also uh, Auntie Lily is here. I'm so blessed, so great to see you. Okay, Kevin, Martha, come here. <laughs> okay, so I would like to give this certificate to Darian Axel Sawali. Please come. Darian. Okay. Okay, you're facing right letter, yeah? Nanti kita we can take photo together. Okay. And then to Anthony Angkrewan. Okay, congrats, Anthony. <laughs> okay, and then Kevin Marta Wijaya. Congrats. Okay. Let's take a picture together and then you show the certificate to them, okay? Okay. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Congrats once again. Okay, God bless you all. Keep that safely with your life, <laughs> the certificate, okay? And I'm so happy to have them with us here. And yeah, I'm looking forward for, for more what God will do in their life, in our life, in this church. God is good. God is good. God is good. And today, as we know that we will be blessed by our um, one of brothers here, we can call it brothers, some of us calling Om, Om Anton, and I'm looking forward what God has store for this church for today. Let's open our hearts, our mind for the word of God to be planted for us. I mean, let us welcome Brother Anton Nius Gunawan. Come on, church. <laughs> God is good. Okay, Om. Um. Good morning, you all. Good morning, good morning. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Ivan, of the opportunity as well as the time given. Uh, I also would like to greet, of course, Lily, my in-law. So these are all my family. Can you, can you see that how big is our family here? <laughs> and of course, uh, we have uh, friends from uh, Monica over there, the other side. Welcome to the family. We, we hope you can also come and join us to be part of the family here the Vancouver City Blessing family. Uh, we can then enjoy all our uh, weekly uh, Bible study or sing the worship and all those things, right? Uh, aside from that, of course, congratulate for the three brothers that just got the baptism. Again, baptism is not the sign of your church membership. It is just a proof that you believe in Jesus and you die together with Jesus 
to be rise up again together with him as well. Amen? Amen. So again, that piece of paper, you have to keep it. Maybe it will, will be useful when you get to go marry. When your wedding ceremony, you might need that piece of paper, okay? Other than that, I believe your journey together with Jesus is more important Amen. than just a piece of paper. Amen? Amen? All right. So today, if I can get the slide up. Are you able to get the slide up, Vanessa? All right, so today we will, uh, I would like to come to, I would like to go back to the Old Testaments. Uh, I prepared a, a sermon relating to Balaam and Balak, right? So let's, uh, before we go to this, uh, uh, slides, uh, probably we'll go to our verses first. Let's go to um, Numbers 22. Numbers 22, verse 1 to 6. Yeah, I, I put the, Bible, uh, the, the sermon title as Balaam and Balak Connections. Let's see what connections do they have, right? So today... Numbers 22 from, um, is this from New Living Translation? Yeah. Can I get the New King James Version for me, please? It's probably easier for me. All right. Okay. Let me read it slowly for you, and I hope that everyone here is not sleeping, but rather put your attention on the words. Because that will be a blessing for you whenever you listen to the word and uh, bring it into your inner person. All right? Numbers 22, verse 1. Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now, Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all the Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, now, this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of sons of his people to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. Okay? This is the first six verses about a time when the Israelites came out from Egypt, led by Moses, walked to, to the land of promise from God, in Canaan, before they cross and go to Canaan, they stop at the Moab plains. Okay, so Moab, at that time, the king was so afraid about these people. They saw the Israelites so many, and they also know from the story that they heard that they see how they sort of uh, beaten up all the nations that's stopping them to go to the land of promise. Okay? So Moab also afraid. Understanding how Israel was led 
by supernaturally at a time, they don't really know God. They know something strong up there, but they don't really know God. So the Moabites call this guy Balaam. Right? Before we learn about who is this guy Balaam and why they call Balaam, I would like to show you the, uh, a slide here. If you would like to see here, that is the place where Israel coming in. Moab is just below there, right? And then you see the Dead Sea and uh, the place where Israel is going in, which is, covered by, uh, which is controlled by Amalek. Before they go in into that place, these people are so afraid of being beaten up by Israel. Next slide, please. Now, as you see that, Israel now on the left side, the Dead Sea down there, and Moab here, and Ammon, right? And you know today, who are they? The Jordan, the Syrian, and all those people. I'll, I'll tell you why. Okay, thank you. Bye. I don't have this at home, so... Okay, this, this is the, the story earlier, right? If you see now, this is Israel, this is Jordan, Syria, and they're all, of course, not so friendly to the Israel. i tell you the story. This happened since the very beginning. Next slide, please. You have to understand who are these people. Who are Moab, actually? If, if you... Are, if you look at uh, the very old story about Terah, which is the father of Abraham, Haran is the brother of Abraham. So Abraham have three, three children, right? Abra uh, uh, I mean, Terah have three children, Abraham, Haran, and Nahor. We didn't put up the Nahor. Haran has a son called Lot. Remember Lot? Right? And Lot has a daughter called whom has a son called Moab and Ben Ami, Ammonites. They call it the Ammonites. Now, um, Abraham line is where Isaac, Jacob, and becoming Israel's, right? So now you know from the very beginning they are not really in, in a good terms, right? Actually, they are still family in the line. But they are not in the good terms till today. Till today. So you know now why there will never be peace over that place. Okay? The story is that, uh, that uh, Abraham was, the give, uh, 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 was receiving a promise from the Lord that they will have three blessings. One, uh, one that uh, people of uh, uh, Abraham will be given land. And the seeds is just as many as the stars on the sky. That's what God promised to him. And the last one is blessing. Whoever part of the Abraham seeds will be blessed. That's why Jesus is coming from that lineage. right? So whoever believes in Jesus, including us today, is part of that covenant. And God's covenant to the Israel never cease till today. So if, you, if some people ask you, how come you believe in God? How do you know God is exist? Just tell them, look at Israel. If Israel is still there, God is still alive. Right? That's the promise of God. That will happen. You and I happen to be part of the outsider that now becoming part of the big seeds of Abraham. Okay, now, you know the background of the story that is important for you to understand why this Balaam can talk to God. Because they are still part of people who really actually understand who God is. Right? But it's just because Lot lived in a wrong place and the influence was so bad that the knowledge about God degrade 
every day until the day of Moabites. Okay? Now, if, you, if, if we continue reading about that story, yeah, let's uh, 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 look at the, uh, the verse in the next verse. Verse 7, Numbers 22, let me read it again. Verse 7 to 14. Got it? Okay. So basically what happened is in from, from verse 7 to verse 14, it's about Balaam is being uh, paid by Balak to curse Israel. Let me read that for you. So the elders of Moab and elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand, and they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. And he said to them, Lord's here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princess of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam, who are this man with you? And so Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face, the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Okay, so, uh, verse 13, So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princess of Balak, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. And the princess, the princess of Moab rose and went back to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Okay, so the story is that this Balaam is a famous prophet at that time. Although I always say he is a non-prophet but prophet. You know why? Because he is paid to do the uh, uh, cursing as well as to do the blessing. So if you pay me well, I bless you. If you don't pay me, I curse you kind of. Or even you can be paid, Balaam can be paid to curse somebody else. And whoever that being cursed by Balaam, their life will be miserable. The story is, then uh, this uh, king of Balak thing, okay, if we can curse that Israelite, of course, when we go war with Israelite, they will be beaten off easily. Because they have been cursed. Now, Balak, uh, I mean Balaam, he is so godly, right? Meaning that, okay, let's, let's stay one night, let's hear what God told me. And then uh, the story is saying that God tell him, don't do it. Don't curse them because they are blessed. Church, first time, okay. I cannot get the money, then God and said, okay, Balaam, go uh, the, to the princess, my princess, sorry, go back home. God refused to do whatever you asked me to do. Then the princess go back to Balak. Balak think another way. You see how Balak is not give up. Oh, I think we need to send a more beautiful princess, more princess to go there with more money. Right? So that's what Balak did. They come back to Balaam and then providing more money with more princess talking to Balaam. And Balaam still very godly says that, oh, even if you give me all the money, the gold, in Balak's palace, if God didn't ask me to do so, it's not going to happen. Very good, right? 
still very godly. I didn't see any wrong with Balaam at that place, at, at that particular moment, right? But uh, why don't you sleep one night? He told the uh, uh, he told the uh, princess of Moab. Why don't you just sleep one more night and see what God tells me? What does it mean? That means Balaam is still hoping God change, correct? He thinks that, oh, hopefully if God changes his mind, at least I will earn quite a big sum of money here. Remember, profit, not profit, right? Now, this prophet slept in the night. And then God told him, since they already come here, why don't you just go there? Right? Without further ado, in the morning, early morning, Balaam quickly go. And God angry, if you read the Bible. Then you're, you're questioning, right? Didn't you, God told him to go? Now, why did you angry if he go? Right? Then, uh, then the story continue. When Balaam riding the donkey... Three times the donkey stopped and would like to go back. Now, on the third time, Balaam got angry and beat the donkey. Right? And the, ton- the funny thing is that the donkey started talking in human language to Balaam. If I were Balaam, I would be afraid, man, that my donkey can speak in my language. And the stupid part, Balaam answered back to the donkey. Which is, I think, is so... What? Why did you talk to your donkey, right? Now, that is the story in the Sunday school, right? If you go to Sunday school, they will tell you about that, that uh, don- uh, Balaam and the donkey. But there is a more deeper story that I would like to share with you now. Look, Balaam, uh, to cut short the story... Balaam finally get to see Balak in the Bel- in the place where the Israelites are camped. So from the upper part, they see. I mean, at that time they saw all the tents of the Israelites, and Balaam still think, "Oh God, maybe this is my work time, God." I have to curse them in order to get money, right? Okay. Then Balaam told Balak, set up seven altars and get the burnt offering, right? Can you imagine seven altars, seven oxen, burn? I I don't know how much money they spent at the time, right? All right. Done. Burn. At the time, Balaam would like to curse. Obviously, the heart is thinking of cursing, right? Nobody wants to say something without thinking it first, right? You know whenever you would like to curse, you are trying to curse at that time. But Balaam cannot curse. Because the word that God put in his tongue at that time is blessing. Yeah. We will study about the detail of the blessing next time. Yeah? I cut short about the blessing. The blessing is beautiful. A lot of teaching you can learn from the blessings that you read in this Bible. But we skip that first. First blessing fail. I mean, first curse fail. Because it came out, uh, came out uh, all the blessing. And now Balak thing. oh, maybe he is too close to see the Israelites. Why don't we go up a bit? They go up to the next place. The second time. So the second time, it's the same. Set up seven altars. Pray to Baal, their God. The Moabites' God at that time. Pray to all the gods of uh, which they don't know. Seven oxen again burn. Of course, it's not the 
the previous one, okay, it's a different place, so you have to build another seven altars. And then the second time, when Balaam would like to curse, the word came out from his mouth, blessing again. Even a better blessing. The second blessing from Balaam is even used by the Jewish people in today's prayer in their synagogue. Can you imagine that? The second fail again. And Balak thing again. Balak is a good king. He never give up, right? Oh man, double, 14 oxen gone. Let's go. Okay. Maybe you are, too cl you are still close. Why don't you go up a bit further, further up? And he went to the mountaintop and then see far away to the Israelites camp. Even Balaam dared not to see, and uh, he tried to see from far away, yet God showed him the beauty of the tents. At the third time, Balaam again failed to curse. Now it's already 21 oxen being burned. 21 oxen being burned because every time they went to the new place they have to set seven altars and kill seven oxen in each of the altars. So it's already three places they go. It's already three curses that not happening basically. Balak is so give up. Balak is so give up. Let's, uh, let's open up in... Um, our Bible in um, Numbers 24. Verse 10. Okay. Numbers 24, verse 10. All right. Then Balak's anger was aroused after three times against Balaam, and he struck his hands together, and Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Right? Verse 11. Now, therefore, flee to your place. I said I would greatly honor you, but in fact, the Lord has kept you back from honor. So, Balak said, actually, I already prepared a lot of money to honor you, to give you, to bless you, but your Lord hold it, didn't give it to you. So, actually, Balak say it's your God's problem, right? So, you cannot be, uh, uh, receive the money. So, technically, Balak didn't want to pay Balaam. Luckily, they just used donkey, right? They didn't, they didn't use so much gas. Can you imagine so much gas already burned and then uh, no money? So Balaam, of course, thinking away on how should I get the money from this Balak, right? And then if you read verse 13 and 14, let me read it so you understand. If Balak were to give, verse 13, if Balak were to give me his house Full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do good or bad of my own will. What the Lord says, that I must speak. Until this point, I think Balaam is still following God's instruction. He just still see that, hey, even if you give me the whole house with full of silver and gold, I cannot do anything if God is not asking me to do. And now, verse 14, And now, indeed, I am going to my people. Come, I will advise you what these people will do to your people in the latter days. So Balaam, Mr. Prophet, of course, have to think hard. 
Oh, I don't want to lose the money. Although I say, mm, I dare not to fight God, but uh, that money is a lot. You know, so hard. She has to think a lot. I'll, 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 I'll jump the story. I'll jump the story. Why don't we go to Numbers 31. Numbers 31. Verse 6. I mean, verse 16. Numbers 31, verse 16. Let me read it for you. Look, this woman caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among congregation of the Lord. Church, Balaam thing away in order to get that money, right? So after three times, he cannot curse the people in Israel. God always put a blessing word in his mouth. He has to bless. In fact, whatever his blessing is happening. And if you lead I mean, if you read further in chapter 24, Numbers 24, you will read all the beautiful oracles about the blessing to the Israelites. One day, when I got a chance, I will, I will, lead, uh, I will, I will show you what are those blessings, what are those blessings that we enjoy today as a covenant, as part of the covenant. With, uh, of Abraham covenant. Okay? Now, after the three times failed, Balaam finally said the fourth blessing. So actually, Balaam blessed Israel four times. The fourth blessing is happening until today. You know? So uh, next time we'll learn about those. But, what I would like you to understand here, from chapter 22, chapter 23, and chapter 24, you learn how the devil tried to attack the Israelites. You understand that the devil is trying to attack you and me as part of the covenant every single day. But again, you also learn, if you are the people of God, if you are the Israelites, if you are part of the government of Abraham, not a single curse can come to you and me. This is something that you need to understand as the people of God. Nothing can come to you, nothing, I mean, no evil impact that will come to you Without his, uh, 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 I mean, we, 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 God will not that happening to you. As long as you and I, as long as you and uh, if you and I are in the covenant of Abraham. That's why it's very important for you and I to be in that covenant. Don't ever get out from this covenant. Because once you get out, once you did not believe Jesus, that's where you are out of home. Right? Okay. Three chapters discussing on how the death will attack you. Three chapters. Chapter 25. Let's read. If you go to Numbers chapter 25, verse 1, I'll read it for you. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry. With the woman of Moab, they invited the people 
to the sacrifices of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Church, the only way, the only way plague or curse come into your life is because you yourself decide to do so. So if you are not involved in that game, nothing can attack you. No matter how good the prophet that being called to curse you, that's not going to happen. No matter how hard the devil tried to curse you, that's not going to happen. But once you said, okay, that's probably a good time for me to try it out. That's the time you invite sin coming into your body. That's the time plague came into, the, uh, into life. So church, you have to remember this. This teaching is letting you know that no, no evil can touch you. It's only you, yourself, that let the evil touch you. Okay? Same thing what happened with actually Eve. Adam and Eve. The first thing they would like to the, they see I mean the, uh, uh, if see the beautiful fruits. The second one, if start to believe what the devil is saying. Then the third time, if decided to join the um, instruction of the devil, actually. Now. If you learn from the Bible from Genesis to the end until Revelation, you will definitely learn and see the same pattern. All people that fall into sin, the pattern is always the same. That they involve in committing it. There is nothing that can impact you from outside, but it's rather that you yourself that Open up your opportunity. Open up the opportunity for the devil to attack you. All right. Now, the reason I'm bringing up this story, so you understand, when I read the next story, the next message from Jesus to the church. Right. Let let us go straight to the last book in our Bible. I would like you to open up Revelation chapter two. I would like you to read verse 12. Uh, we jump around, okay, on the verses. I am not um, preparing for the, for the uh, message of this church, but I just would like to give you the relationship between these two stories. Um, give me the first 14 first. Sorry, Vanessa. If you can jump to first 14 first. Yeah, okay. So, Jesus... This is a, the church, Pergam, uh, Pergamum church in, in the Revelation. There is a seven churches that God addressing with their own uh, problem uh, from that, uh, each of those churches. In Pergamum, Jesus said to this church, But I have a few things against you. So this is something that Jesus didn't like with this church. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. So, in the Pergamum church, yeah, next time we'll learn about why Pergamum church, he addresses it this way. In the Pergamon church, basically, there are a lot of this sexual immorality as well as eating food for the idol or 
idolatries. And Jesus addressed it as a doctrine of Balaam. So technically, Balaam doctrine is a doctrine that teaching people to be okay with the sin of body. Because God is looking at only your soul. So as long as your soul is safe, your body commits sin, is okay. That's the teaching of Balaam during that church. We will, we will, we will uh, 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 come back to this in the next time. The thing is that this is something that Jesus don't like about this church. Now, if you go back to verse 12, Revelation 2, verse 12. Got it? I'll read for you Revelation first, chapter 2, verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says, He who has the sharp two-edged sword, verse 13, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was faithful, was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Okay. In verse 12, that is how Jesus introduced himself to that church. That he is the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. Right? So Jesus introduced himself as the sharp two-edged sword. In Balaam's story in the Old Testament, the donkey stop saw an angel carrying sword. Three times carrying sword. Right? And the angel said to Balaam, actually the donkey saved your life. If the donkey didn't turn away, Surely I already kill you with the sword. Right? When in Pergamos, Jesus said to the angel of the church or the pastor of the church that he who has the two-edged sword. And in verse 14 that we just read earlier is that Jesus do not like this church because some of them holding the doctrine of Balaam. Right? Now, let's read verse 16. Chapter 2, verse 16. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Church, in this particular church of Pergamos, Jesus addressed himself with a two-edged sword. As a final verse that I would like to share with you this morning, let's open up our, our Bible in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Let me read it for you. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of heart. Now you understand why God angry to Balaam. Because God see into the intents of hearts. So Balaam didn't really go there because they, he would like to follow God's instruction. God know the intention of Balaam. Church, the only way you know right or wrong in your own heart and soul is by going to the sword. By going to the word of God. Amen. 
And again, today, I just wanted you to go home with two things. One, that no external impact will impact your life. There is no curses can happen in your life except you yourself open that opportunity for the devil. That's why God says to Cain, if you remember, God says to Cain, why are you angry? It, it's just like the devil is waiting in front of you like a roaring, uh, a roaring lion. They are ready to devour you. Right? Remember that. No external impacts can affect you. No plague can come to you. Number one. Number two. Remember, whenever you fall to sin, the only way to repent is go back to the Word of God. I invite you all to stand up. Before I, sign, uh, before I give it back to Pastor Ivan, I just want all of you close your eyes and have a minute of conversation with our Lord Jesus. If so happened at this time, anyone from, from you in this place or the one that watching online, you never know God is alive. You never think that Jesus is a living God. Now is the time. He is alive. He is here. And He's waiting for you to receive him. He is opening up the door just like the time in Noah's time. The big boat door is open, waiting for people who would like to join Noah into the boat. That is what's happening today. That any one of us or anyone who listened to this word God is inviting you. God is inviting you. Come and join into the boat. I give you one minute to have your personal relationship with God at this moment. No matter how bad is your sin, God has died to that. Jesus has died to that. And because of his sacrifice, you and I get to stand behind him to be seen holy by our God, by our Lord. You and I now enjoy the covenant that he has given to Abraham. You and I now part of the blessings. Remember, our life is full of blessing that you never realized. Now is the time. Now is the time. Father, we thank you for such a wonderful day. Such a wonderful blessing. The more we understand your love, Lord, the more we understand how you protect us, Lord, the more we realize how small we are in our understanding about you, Lord. The more we learn, Lord, that you protect us in every single situation, the more we, we know, Lord, the more we understand that we should walk in confidence that one day we will meet you face by face. So we can see you Face to face, Lord. We can see you as part, uh, we can see ourselves as part of the kingdom of God. Lord Jesus, forgive all our sin, all our iniquities, which then, Lord, 
the release of blessings we may receive. All the blessings that you have given to us, we may receive in not only gladness, but also with the full of understanding of your love to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In my teenager's name, I pray. All the people say, Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Antonius, for a wonderful message to remind us that if God is with us, nothing can against us. Amen. Now this is the time for us to partake the Holy Communion together. I know that all of you already have these elements. Every first Saturday of the month, we do the Holy Communion together as church. The bread here that we have represents the body of Christ broken for sinful men. And the cup represents the blood of Christ that was shed for sinful men for cleansing sin. So if you look at the, the element here, the top is the bread and this is the, the wine for us. We can partake together here. I'm going to read one scripture here from John chapter 6, verse 53 to 56. John chapter 6, verse 53 to 56. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood have eternal life. And I will raise that person at the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is to drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. So are you ready, church? Let's take the bread and the cup together and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for what you've done on the cross for us. You came and you died for us to save us from our sin and eternal death. And you rose again from death to give us hope and future. As we are partaking this Holy Communion, the bread and the wine, we are declaring your healing power for our body your cleansing redemption for our soul, and your divine blessing for our life, and for our kids, and for our generations. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your mighty Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Let's eat and drink the bread and the wine together in Jesus' name. And then lift both our hands and then we're going to close this service for today. Father, we want to give thanks to you. I thank you for the word of God that be planted in our hearts. You remind us that there's power in you. That Jesus lives in us, the hope of glory. If God is with us, nothing can against us. Protect us, Lord, from any, the devil, enemy, Satan, deception. They're trying to put us down. And I pray for protection upon the church, your people's life. And wherever we go, we believe that God is with us and you give us future and hope. I thank you and we receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great weekend. I will see you again next week. Thank you. God bless.